I'm the uh, Groton Fire Chief and also Chair of the Slug Board of Groton. Carrie? Carrie Dillon, Waterbury Fire Department. The people that information and I'm sorry, would you, gentlemen, would you do that again? You were really quick. Gary Dillon, Waterbury Fire Department. Thank you, Gary. I also meant to call on Carrie McCool. The only time you would jump. Sorry, I'm Carrie McCool. I'm the dispatch supervisor at Montpelier Police. Thank you. Dominic. Sorry, you caught me off guard. Uh, Dominic, uh -huh. I'm a subject matter expert with Televate and uh, happy to be here. Uh, Rick? I'm Rick. Oh, you muted yourself. Okay, I'm, I'm Rick Burke, <laughs> uh, managing partner with Televate, and likewise, happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Kim? Kim Cheney, I'm a member of CVPSA and uh, live in Montpelier. Thank you. Uh, John? Quinn? John Quinn, representing the town of Berlin, Berlin Select Board. And Ryan? Ryan Brista, Washington Fire Chief. Uh, the person at the phone of 777-5052. I'm not hearing you. Are you? I know you're unmuted yourself. Can you say your name and your town of residence? Okay. If you get a chance, we'll come back to you. Otherwise, go back and mute your phone. And then the other person on the phone, four nine eight eight five nine two. Could you please? This is Pete Damasi, Northfield Fire Chief. Kathy Northfield. Thank you. Uh, is, is that uh, Walter under Dorothy's name? I can't see. Just all I can see is Dorothy. There. I'm sorry, sir, but the only name coming up, I think, must be maybe your wife's, the person using Dorothy's uh, computer. Sister Wayne. Chief Wayne, not Wayne. Wayne, thank you. Capital Mutual Aid. And uh, John Neely. Is that Needley? This is Kading. Kading? K-A-D-I-N. Uh, you, you may be uh, talking about John Kading. That's me. I'm uh, on the select board uh, from Worcester. Thank you. And there's Thank a you. Greg. Thanks for being here. Greg? Yes. Would you introduce yourself and what town you're from? Uh, Greg Light, town of Plainfield. Thank you. And mute yourself when you're not speaking. And the same for you. Thank you, Wayne and Greg. Mute yourselves. Uh, Jean? Jen. Jen? Mm -hmm. Jennifer Minor, President, Cabot Ambulance. Thank you. Keith? Keith Van Otterstein, Berlin Fire Department Chief. Thank you. Um, Moortown Chief. Would you present Pratt, Moortown Fire Chief. Did you say your first name again? Stefan. Stefan, thank you. Uh, Montpelier Police. Uh, good evening, everybody. Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department. Thank you. Christine Sullivan. Christine Sullivan, uh, Waitsfield Select Board. And I have to, um, uh, Chris Smith. Chris Schmidt, Cabot Ambulance Vice President. 
Thank you. Uh, Nicholas? Nick Brissett, Washington Select Board. Thank you. Callie? Callie Streeter, Moortown Select Board, Fire Department Liaison. Thank you. Uh, Brent, uh, Doug Brent? Doug Brent, Fire Chief, City of Barrie. Thank you. Anyone I missed who hasn't had a chance to state their name and their town of residence? I see Will up there and Sally, who I missed earlier. Will, you want to go first? Sure. Will Sutton, Worcester Fire Chief. Thank you. Sally? Sally Dillon, Waterbury Fire and Capital Fire representative to CVPSA. Thank you. And Trip, I believe Trip has joined us since I went through that row. Uh, Trip Johnson, Chief of Wastefield Face and Fire Department. Anyone else that I've missed that's attending remotely? Okay. So in Dave person. Dave McCain, Town of Roxbury. Dave Roxbury. Thank you. All right, in person, and you want to come, you want to stand up and introduce yourselves, just say your name and your residence. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Jeff Campbell, Warren Fire Chief. Well, Walter Bothfeld, Cabot Fire Chief. Joe Alter, Deputy Fire Chief, City of Erie. Okay, thank you. I think that will help, and, and especially if any of us need to go back over and review this recording, we'll have some clear clear names and positions because the names on the screen usually give us one or the other, where you're from or your name. So thank you. I, I want us to get into the, the meat of this meeting. I think you're all familiar with that we have this wonderful report. I would get, like to give you a little backstory that Central Vermont Public Safety Authority a little bit of history. Some of you know it, many of you may not, but our total vision is working together to improve regional public safety services. We felt that combining local control of the many would form a more efficient, effective, sustainable regional public safety service. And that would enhance the hiring and retaining of employees, offering more training and advancement opportunities. We feel that working together to improve how public safety services are delivered and how they're paid for, that by combining local control, we have a larger control regionally and particularly a larger voice when it comes to state and federal funding. We hope to use the meat of this report to advance further applications for those funds and would like for the Capital Farm Mutual Aid System to sign on with a commitment of sending two representatives to be a core team to work with our consultants, Televet, that would really nail down the issues of governance and cost formulas, ones that you can accept through your representatives and the ones that the city can accept through their representatives. That we need to go forward and we can't go forward without dealing with these two core issues. Now, I've been with this process of moving towards regional public safety coalition since 2006, when I was president of the board of the Central Vermont Chamber of Commerce, and I worked with George Malik. We informally worked for three years until 2009, when we had an official committee, which we had two appointments from each town, Barry City, Barry Town, Berlin, and Montpelier. These eight people and two representatives of Central Vermont Chamber of Commerce sat around the table for four years working on the current charter and trying to get towns to vote to join. He did a lot of pre presentations to the select boards at the time and almost had four towns being the, the, the coalition behind Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. But politicians, you know, sometimes you get reelected, sometimes you don't. And the scenery changed a lot over those four years, and we ended up with only two communities voting to join the Public Safety Authority at that time. 
So when the charter went to the legislators in 2014, we had the city of Barrie and the city of Montpelier as voted in members. Since then, we've reached out continuously hoping to have other towns join us. And we're very, very pleased when Capital Farm Mutual Aid voted to join us in July of 2018. And right away, we had Sally and Will uh, being there, a very essential, important part of all the work we've done with consultants since then. Now, we presented three different studies, I call business cases, of whether or not this public safety authority group would advance a one location dispatch center or one system with two location dispatch center. At one point, we were even at, uh, did a study on just having Montpelier be the regional center because Barry wasn't sure it wanted to continue. So we felt like we've explored a lot and we're hoping that this last study will use what was done, but move on in a whole new way. The Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, and I personally am not here to advocate that we're the network entity, but we are the entity that has the funding to do the planning if you will all participate with us and with a real commitment that we wanna do this work and get the governance model and the cost formulas that you and the cities can accept. And that's what we're about tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rick and uh, Doug Hoyt may chime in, other people may chime in as, uh, and in fact, Doug, maybe you wanna say a statement now, Doug Hoyt, you wanna say something now or do you wanna chime in while they're presenting? In the in <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> in the interest of time, I'd like to uh, have Dom and Rick uh, go over the plan or the, or the, results of their work, uh, which I think you'll find uh, quite revealing. And uh, it should underscore exactly why we're sitting here tonight, uh, looking at this and contemplating the future. Okay, it's your show, Rick and Dom. Oh, answer. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, oh, time out. I missed it. I said I looked at my agenda. I missed public comment. Uh, so, um, Stephen? Well, yeah, and also, Bob, it's a joint meeting, yep. so Bob right. Field's got his own. Same thing, uh, public comment. It's that time? Yep, yep. Okay, we well, have a two, in, minute, two minutes. In the interest of time, uh, I ran over by a half a minute last night, so I'm not going to read the uh, statement that I prepared for last night. I will email that to Joe and uh, ask him to circulate it. Um, but I want to point out a couple of things to watch for tonight, because I argued for this study for years, three years back, that we needed to get this needs assessment completed. And then we put out an RFP and then we compromised it uh, and, and narrowed it uh, for the second RFP. Last night, we were told that this, that Telvade has completed a vulnerability or a resiliency assessment and an inventory. And those things are not evident here. What it's clear, what's clear, what's become clear is that even buying a brand new system, a multi-million dollar system is going to take a year or two before it's built and online, which means that we need to identify what are the weak points in the system we have now and think about buying some spares. Uh, and that's primarily a capital fire uh, scope and responsibility. But this type of planning, we enter from the needs assessment into an engineering phase and then an RFP or a series of RFPs. So we're at least two years out before a new system is online and we can't afford to have this system fail in the next two years. So the, both the inventory and the resiliency assessment uh, I would ask you to hammer on Televate to get those deliverables because I don't see them. Um, and it's all about the governance. I will that you'll see that in a written piece. And we also need to address there's a new contract in effect between Capital Fire and Montpelier for the dispatch. But but life life threatening issues are getting 
swept under the rug, uh, delays and failed responses by CapWest. And there's no reporting. There, there's no accumulated log or reporting or training being addressed there. It's two minutes, you're up, you're done. Why don't you stop Donna when she went over two minutes? She? Uh, okay, I, I do wanna clarify uh, one point. It came up after the meeting last night when we presented to the city councils. Uh, Stephen has done a lot of due diligence in his own personal interests, but he does talk from himself. He does not talk the we of public safety authority. So I just want to clarify that as all citizens have the right to opinions and he has a lot of experience, but he has, he is not part of the public safety authority board, nor has he been directed by the central Vermont public safety board to talk to us talk on, on our behalf. Sorry, I didn't say that quite right. So on that note, uh, let's anyone else have a public comment that's from the group, something that's not on the agenda that you would like to state. All right, Rick. Thank you, Donna. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I am uh, pleased to be here and we were honored and, and still honored to be uh, part of this, uh, this effort and, and part of a, a broad team to, uh, to have conducted this study. And uh, we uh, look forward to presenting our findings and recommendations to you tonight. Um, before I get started, I, I would like to, uh, you know, send a, you know, a, a, you know, words of gratitude to a, a broad-based team that, that really supported us. Uh, Kim and Paco and Donna and Doug and Doug Brent, Joe Ellsworth, Scott Bag, Paul Starudi, uh, Carrie McCool, and and a number of you that I, if I didn't mention, I appreciate you. We're there was a, a great deal of participation. Um, um, across uh, uh, all aspects of this program. And, um, you know, it was, it, we actually were able to build on a body of work and effort that had been ongoing for some time. Um, so um, uh, we, I'm sorry, I was watching the screen jump and I'm lost. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really believe that, you know, what we're, what we've engaged on with all of you is a collaborative effort. Uh, we build a lot of good relationships and friendships along the way. And, um, you know, we try, we honor those and, and, and we really are, uh, you know, we're, we may not be uh, members of your community and, in, 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 in physical living there, but we are members of your community and, and, uh, and you know want, want to do and, and assist you however best so that you can um, you know achieve uh, your objectives and so some of what we want to talk about are are those objectives so uh, Dom if you could please begin sharing the presentation um, that would be appreciated so while yes. Dom is bringing up the presentation I, I just want to tell you we you know we we have we have a very long presentation but we consolidated it um, to a number of key slides, and, and we're going to go through those slides. Uh, we want to uh, have a good pace on this presentation so that, um, you know, we give you an opportunity to ask questions and to, um, you know, get your, you know, get your answers uh, 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 to those questions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, a lot of what we're going to present to you is not news to a, a number of you. Um, and and will be you know will be new news to a, a number of you as well. But uh, there, the, it is in you know because of the uh, the hard work, creative ac activity, um, impressive discipline of people who who are the first responders and the dispatchers themselves who are you know, who are serving their communities. And communicating off of, you know, as we'll explain to you, a, a very uh, at-risk uh, radio communication network. So, um, Don, have you got the ability to share your screen? Uh, I need for the host to enable screen sharing, uh, Donna or whoever is acting as a host. Well, it says that I'm, I've got it marked. That's why I, I bumped the, uh, <laughs> the screen when I tried to screen share. So it should be screen sharing. Did you try and not able to? Uh, that, that's correct. It uh, gives me a message, host disabled participant screen sharing. 
I believe you're sharing your screen. Yep. Now try it. Okay. Uh, still, still getting that same message, I'm afraid. Okay. I see that you're no longer sharing, but uh, has not enabled participant sharing yet. Okay, I think um, I'm sorry. I'm technically challenged. <laughs> now here it comes. There, I should be sharing now. Hopefully. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, I'll go into presentation mode. Hopefully, that makes it easier for everyone to see. How's that? Mm, Is that uh, showing full screen now? Not quite. Yeah, we're seeing the notes on there. We don't want to see your notes. Okay. Uh, so maybe because I have another uh, monitor hooked up. Excuse me. All right. Uh, well, Aldama's, uh, you know, uh, arranging it. Uh, what what we've you know, agreed with with Donna is that you know we'll go through a slide or two or three and then we'll ask questions. But you know, ask if you have a question. So, but you know, at any given time, if you have a question, I I, I think you know we don't we would prefer not to wait to the end. Um, information, real time information, is going to be valuable. So, um, anyway, with that said. Uh, you know, let's have this free flowing and um, let's be sure that all participants uh, get out of this meeting what they they arrive and what they're attending that to. Over here or just minimize it. Well, I tried. Uh, are, you, are you seeing a uh, full screen? Yes. Now? Uh, yes, it's great. That's perfect. Great. Okay. So with that said, um, we, uh, Televay was retained uh, by the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority and its board and members. Um, to conduct a telecommunication needs assessment and to provide recommendations uh, based on our findings. And so what we've done is we've uh, prepared a presentation um, and our agenda is to go over the you know, project objectives and to discuss the project scope. Please mute. Our key findings, uh, present our recommendations, next steps, and, and then let's have some open discussion. So with that said, Away we go. All right, so the, the, the study, there, there was, a, a, you know, primary objectives were documented in the study, and, and the needs assessment really was to document and assess existing communication systems for capital fire of the capital fire mutual aid systems, city of Montpelier, and Barry City. Our focus were on, on those systems, and, and primarily, now, when you look at telecommunication systems, and we're really looking at radio systems, um, uh, dispatch capabilities, and um, you know, we also looked at at broadband within the community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, uh, in terms of our our principal objectives, were to identify the gaps in these systems. You know, what what how do they perform, or how aren't they performing the way they need to perform? And, and we base that on the interoperable continuum of the Department of Homeland Security, which is a good standard model, and, and all best practices. We, we've been in business for 20 years, and between Dom and I, we have over 70 years of experience, and you know, collectively our team members have hundreds of years of experience in public safety communication systems. We've seen systems of all different sizes and, and shapes and, and frequency bands and Anyway, so we, we have a, a, a collective body of work that we were able to reference um, um, and put in this and um, conducting this study. And then our, our, our goal then was to determine options and the cost to upgrade the systems to meet end user requirements. Um, and certainly, as we're going to do here, is to provide next step recommendations. <clears throat> to continue, the ta there was two primary tasks, and there was uh, a, a dozen and a half uh, or so subtasks, but you know, task one was to complete a region-wide assessment 
of the existing public safety communication systems and to define stakeholder requirements. And, and, and supporting that, we, we talk to a, a, all, a variety of, of, of engaged stakeholders and, and the service area of interest is really colored there in peach and in blue, the primary service areas of, of Central Fire, uh, City of Montpelier and, and Bowery City. And so, you know, that was our defined service area of interest. We additionally, our task was to propose solutions with design and cost estimates for resolving indoor and outdoor radio dead zones in Bowery City, in Montpelier, and for central fire service areas. And, and that really, that's our primary objectives. So with that said, <clears throat> here's an overview of our findings. Um, you know, there needs to be, and so we're going to start, you know, with a, a police overview. Um, um, uh, let's see, we, you know, we, in, in order to develop these, we communicate directly with representatives from the, from the police and, and the, the police chief from Montpelier was part of that and others. But anyway, uh, improved in building coverage. Um, certainly you, you know, your buildings are, uh, not the average. I mean, you have a thick granite walls, the radio signals just, um, you know, have a hard time getting through. Um, in, in, additionally, there are interoperability um, between different public safety responders, police, fire, emergency medical, emergency management, uh, with capital police and others um, that, you know, are, are still not where they would like them to be. And there needed to be a continuity of operations. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, what, what that really means, but definitely communication plans and practicing them. And then, you know, there's a, a need for the upgrade of the dispatch consoles. Uh, your consoles are really, um, they, they are quite ancient. I mean, you're still, they're still functioning because, you know, you work, you, you work hard to make them function and, and you have, uh, um, support, you know, a, a, a radio shop support all those, but basically they are out of date and they're at risk of failure uh, at any given time. Uh, Rick, if I can offer uh, a case in point, I understand uh, uh, there is some difficulty uh, right now with the dispatch council uh, not uh, fully uh, communicating the uh, information on a uh, call for service. The beating tones are going out, but then the information going is cut off. Understand that's being dealt with right now. Thank you, Don. All right. Next slide, please. All right. So our key findings for fire land mobile radio systems and. You know, I mean, the, the, the term of art is really land mobile radio. We're going to recall, well, you know, LMR, land mobile radio, radio systems. I mean, walkie talkies. I mean, basically, we're talking about your, your, your critical radio communication. So mission critical radio communications is what we assess. And again, I, I, before I go into this, I just want to say, uh, again, uh, um, a number of you um, have been working and presenting your needs for quite some time. And, and ideally we can use, and all of, all of you can use this, you know, the, this report, documented report, public information available to, you know, all the to your community, um, you know, to, to, you know, to adopt, uh, to refine governance, to find funding and to implement it as quickly as possible. Um, and so your, your system is antiquated, uh, using antiquated equipment and technology and a configuration. It is, a, it is an old school design. And, and in fact, uh, we have looked at, you know, hundreds of systems over our career, if not more. And, you know, this is one of the most antiquated systems we have seen. And I, I hate to be so blunt about it, but I don't think I'm telling you anything that you didn't already know and that you have not been trying to address and, and, and resolve. Um, you're using a single frequency for multiple departments. That means you, you, you frequently talk over one another or you, know, you can't even hear one another because you know, you're also the same frequency is used both to you know, talk to and from dispatch. So you're, you know, you're, 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 the, the configuration of the radio network is not conducive to uh, reliable uh, performance. 
And, and you know, you also have a radio, your radio channel is interfered with um, both from Canada taxi um, communications and elsewhere within the state of Vermont. So, you know, and, and again, the, I'm telling you what we, we identified um, through our requirements gathering, identifying needs and assessments and gaps and, you know, and your channel is, you know, that channel, single channel for so many users so many communities is is uh, is highly congested, um, and, and it's very just difficult to communicate over because of the configuration of the radio network. Next slide, please. All right. So there's additionally there are coverage gaps throughout the service area. There there are areas where you have to make calls for service that you can't hear the primary radio network, the over the air network, um, and and you've. You know, you, what you what your responding community does is they uh, wisely, um, um, you know, relay information. They they may have to go to a to a location where they can hear the radio network, uh, and then drive and 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 use a tactical radio channel over the radio. Uh, how your re, your responders, you know, miraculously um, know the flaws of the network and figure, you know, have figured out ways around it so that you can communicate when needed. Um, uh, it's the same with dispatch. Uh, you know, the, the, everyone is working very hard to ensure that 911 calls for service and calls for dispatch to respond to the service are, are done the way, and, and, you know, the way that public safety needs to be responsive. And, you know, you, you make it happen because of your hard work and your intelligence about how to make the system work. It's not an optimal way to do it. It's, it's actually very dangerous uh, for not only the responders, but for the communities you serve. Your in-building communication issues are, are, are paramount. Um, the the over-the-air radio network uh, does not serve your in-building uh, environments, whether in cities, uh, uh, in city environments or in town environments, because there's just not enough RF out there to, to support the, you know, their communication requirements. There's a lack of redundancy um, in your radio systems on the backhaul networks. They're single link, and they're, you know, they, and typically when we we design radio public safety radio networks, communication networks at mission critical grade. So to achieve mission critical grade, you have to have redundancy on your backhaul networks. You have to have redundancy on your power networks. You have to have redundant components um, so that you can quickly repair and, and replace and address issues real time. Um, your, your, your system is old, uh, 30, you know, it's age equipment and it's a high risk of equipment failure. And, and um, you know, I, I've been very direct about this because we want, need to let those who are, you know, have the responsibility of, of, of finding a way to resolve it, understand it. Critical information is delayed or missed when communicated. Uh, the way the network is architected, um, it's not a simulcast network. So you have to communicate off of a particular radio channel and the responders, because of your, your terrain, um, it may be better that you're communicating off of one radio tower than uh, than than another, and and it's it's just very complicated um, to do it. So, you know, in reality, um, you know, your communication gaps delay and hamper response and put your first responders and the communities they serve at, at, at risk. And, and with that said, uh, are there any questions uh, before we you know we move on? You may unmute yourself and say, I have a question, and just identify yourself. Okay. okay there'll, be, there'll be plenty of time um, as we go through. Uh, so um, with that said, um, next slide, Dom. And so uh, Dom is going to uh, present the recommendations. Uh, thank you, Rick, and good evening, everyone. Uh, again, very uh, pleased and uh, honored to be here and have been honored to work on this project with uh, many of the uh, professionals here. Uh, I will uh, go through the recommendations in a number of areas that we investigated, uh, many of them uh, parallel what you just saw. Uh, to start out with the police 
LMR uh, radio system. As you might expect, these recommendations uh, mirror some of the key issues we identified. Uh, certainly there's a uh, need for additional radio coverage in the uh, uh, city areas, uh, and in particular downtown Montpelier, uh, due to difficulty coverage in buildings. Uh, so additional uh, uh, radio site would enhance that and is uh, sorely needed. Uh, additionally, uh, vehicular repeaters are being used today in uh, a number of areas. Uh, we recommend uh, further use of vehicular repeaters, which would also uh, enhance uh, the coverage uh, throughout the, the service area. Vehicular repeater can, use, can be used, of course, on, on a mobile vehicle and it can extend coverage where you may not have uh, coverage sufficient to uh, reach portable radios. Uh, also, uh, Rick had mentioned the need for continuity of operations, interoperability. Uh, we, re we recommend a regional uh, task force uh, be put together to uh, develop interoperability standard operating procedures. Uh, specifically on the law enforcement side, there, of course, is uh, uh, Montpelier uh, Police, there's City of Barrie Police, there's Capitol Police, uh, Washington County Sheriff, uh, all they need to interoperate on, uh, on various occasions. Uh, fortunately, those users are on the same uh, uh, radio frequency band, uh, but there still are specific uh, frequencies and procedures that should be defined uh, in order to uh, maintain that interoperability and to provide that new service for events. On the, on the fire uh, side, uh, we recommend a regional standards-based simulcast radio network uh, be developed. Uh, E25 is a standard that was developed for public safety communications and is in wide use uh, throughout the country. We recommend this, the system being E25 capable uh, also being analog capable to allow uh, migration over a, a, a period of time. Uh, there has been some work done uh, previously, as Rick mentioned, uh, some of the stakeholders, uh, many uh, on, on this uh, call today, uh, have been working diligently to put together a concept. Elevate was able to uh, build on that concept and provide additional uh, requirements and additional definition of the regional system. Uh, the intent, of course, would be to improve coverage throughout the entire capital fire response area. We would also uh, recommend incorporating additional vehicular repeaters uh, to enhance uh, the portable radio coverage in particular. One of the key issues that you're dealing with, as Rick mentioned, was congestion, especially on the uh, uh, fire communication side. Uh, we recommend adding additional radio channels so there can be separate, separate channels for the city operations, uh, Barry and Montpelier, uh, and uh, Capital Fire, which extends, of course, throughout uh, uh, many of the towns uh, surrounding the central Vermont area. Uh, of course, the radio channels uh, currently are experiencing some interference. We need to identify interference-free VHF uh, channels uh, to be used. Some of that has been done and the initial licensing has begun. Uh, again, we commend uh, the stakeholders for their diligence in uh, identifying those and we recommend continuing with that process. Another item uh, that is of concern is that the, uh, uh, some tactical radio channels are used currently primarily for communications on scene. Uh, generally, that's a radio to radio communication that does not go through the infrastructure, uh, which uh, currently cannot be monitored by dispatch and that creates a, a safety issue for the first responders. We recommend this regional system should include additional receivers for those tactical channels to allow monitoring of that on-scene communication by dispatch uh, to, uh, to enhance the safety of our first responders. 
We mentioned uh, dispatch consoles were a, a current uh, concern. Uh, There's a critical update needed for those dispatch consoles. Uh, they are uh, two different manufacturers consoles are used today in the two uh, different PSAPs, uh, Montpelier and Barry. Uh, both of them are out of support, uh, no longer supported by their uh, manufacturer. We recommend upgrading those and we recommend utilizing a common uh, dispatch console between the two PSAPs. This will enhance uh, interoperability uh, between the two and also uh, provide ease of continuity of operations and uh, redundancy uh, should one PSAP have to take over operations or another uh, during a critical time frame. Currently, uh, there's not a uh, a public safety grade CAD system uh, in use. Uh, there is a system uh, uh, being used today uh, known as Valcor. Uh, that's primarily a management system. Uh, a full featured CAD system is recommended uh, to be implemented. We understand uh, the state is uh, uh, working with Valcor to implement such a system. We recommend that be adopted by both PSAPs with a common system, common CAD system to again uh, enhance uh, redundancy and continuity of operation. And, and also a, uh, a fiber connection circuit between the two PSAPs uh, was uh, recently in installed in order to uh, allow communication between the two and monitoring of the operations uh, uh, across the different PSAPs. We recommend that be upgraded to a redundant circuit uh, to again uh, ensure continuity of operations and resiliency. Uh, we, we also looked at uh, recommendations for regional interoperability and we recommend documenting uh, radio communications plans uh, as, as mentioned earlier specifically for uh, interoperability, identifying what frequencies and uh, resources are available, how are they to be used in, in an event of which uh, includes uh, multiple agencies uh, working together. Uh, those plans uh, need to be uh, reviewed and all users need to be trained uh, through uh, both tabletop and on-scene exercises in order to, uh, to make sure those plans are effective and they can be put into use when needed. Uh, also, the uh, radio network that we recommend uh, needs uh, standard operating procedures uh, to ensure it's uh, operated at peak uh, efficiency and utilizes all the uh, uh, functionality available. So, so Dom, uh, let's take a, see if there's a question break here before we move on, all right? Um, that's a, a lot of information we've covered and want to be sure that the audience understands it. I mean, some of you may not know what a CAD system is. Uh, um, most of you know, may know, but is, is there, are there any questions uh, about what our recommendations are so far? Uh, I had a couple along that line, Rick, Donna Bates speaking. Yes, One, to really explain the difference between CAD and data keeping. And the other was, I think it was a misspoke. Uh, Dom mentioned PSAP. When he met, really, I think he meant dispatch center. So you might want to discuss those two also. Okay, so I'll, I'll take the dispatch center first. Uh, that's always a, uh, that's a, uh, I think, you know, obviously uh, CVPSA uh, has some background on, on PSAPs, uh, public safety answering points. Uh, they are really the location where the 911 calls uh, are received. And then they are from there, they're delivered to dispatch centers um, so that, you know, dispatching for the service call can be managed. In many cases so that throughout the country, the PSAP and the dispatch center are one and the same. Um, now there are, you know, in most cases, uh, we consolidate dispatch and PSAP together. Um, now, and certainly there are hybrid models like that you have. I mean, your, your dispatch, your, your PSAP is not in your community, it's outside of your community. Um, and then your, your calls for service arrive there, they're directed to the PSAP, and then they're forwarded out for, for local dispatching. 
And so there, you know, there, there are benefits to having your own PSAP because a PSAP uh, as, a, as a, a body can also collect uh, 911 fees uh, that we collect for phones and cell phones and, and internet phones and, and other communications. Uh, there's a service fee, a 911 service fee that is collected from all phone uh, subscriptions. Um, and that money goes to the PSAP and can be used for a variety of purposes. You, you know, in central Vermont, you don't have your own PSAP. And um, normally PSAPs, uh, you know, there's an advantage to being a PSAP, but there are also um, concerns about um, dispatch centers and PSAPs in some regards. So um, Dom, Dom, if Dom did say PSAP and that was quickly you'd pick it up, I, I didn't and I'm, I'm listening intently, but um, that, that, that will cover the PSAP uh, explanation. And, and, and if there are questions, then I'll be happy to answer them. I have a question, Donna. Oh, just a minute, Kim. I want to hear the CAD. All right. Dom, you want to take the CAD, sir? Yes. Uh, uh, Donna, your question was regarding uh, uh, CAD and how that is used. Is that well, correct? Diff I want a clear explanation between the CAD system and what the data collection we have now, why it matters. Okay, uh, CAD system is a tool used by uh, uh, dispatch uh, operators uh, to uh, help them efficiently, uh, and it stands for computer aided dispatch. Uh, it's a system that helps them efficiently uh, handle a, a request for service, helps them efficiently dispatch the correct, uh, uh, the correct unit or the correct uh, responding uh, uh, agency. Uh, it helps them organize information regarding the call and record that. Uh, and uh, in cases where you have uh, connectivity to, uh, to vehicles or responders in the field, uh, they can use the CAD system to provide additional information to the first responders uh, on scene as well. Uh, right now, the system currently in use is primarily just for uh, what's called records management or RMS, uh, records management system, uh, which uh, strictly just records information associated with the, with the call for service and, and does not uh, provide the additional benefits of the dispatch operator or the users in the field. And, and if I could add to that, it is very rare to see a community of your size not have a computer aided dispatch system that you that you can rely on to ensure that you're the, the right you know the right person is the right person are being dispatched that is also a repository for the distant, different types of, of apparatus available that you know could be called for service and researched and available. Um, it also is, gives you tr allows you to track who has been dispatched, and in the event that there's another call for service, you know a dispatcher can look and say, well, I can, you know, this this responding uh, uh, agency is closer. We can we we could call them into service. It, it, a very um, a very robust uh, way to manage uh, calls uh, for service and the dispatching of the first responders uh, for mission critical incidents. Uh, Kim, I believe you had a question. I did. Uh, Rick. Yes, sir. You're talking to fire chiefs and residents of primarily the towns that surround the two cities. Right. Can you please tell them why their citizens and families are at risk because of the operations of the existing system. Uh, yes, sir, I, I'll be happy to. Um, uh, it's, I'm not happy to tell you that you're at risk, but uh, I can certainly explain to, to you. And, and I'm sure that the fire chiefs, uh, you know, could probably even more elegantly and directly explain it, but I'd be happy to, to give my perspective and if anyone else wants to add to it. Um, a, a call for service requires a rapid response in order to ensure that the incident um, is responded to in, in, in as quickly a, a, the amount of time as possible. 
um, to and, and, and to save you know to to safeguard lives and property and and also for the the safety of the responders themselves. Um, delays in, in communications or lack of communications um, puts the community at risk. Uh, the information that needs to be conveyed to the responders, you know, who are who are going to you know be on scene or going to uh, respond to a call for service, and this includes a uh, fire and ambulance uh, uh, um, and, and personnel. Uh, I mean, uh, your 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 citizens uh, who are in need of service for police and fire um, and uh, ambulance services uh, are are at risk in the event that there that those radio transmissions uh, required to alert and and call the service uh, of the closest uh, um, uh, fire or ambulance uh, service, are, uh, they don't get their, that information uh, in, in a timely manner. And then they don't have uh, robust, reliable performance um, all throughout their, their response. Uh, receiving the information call for service and in, in route to the call for service on scene, um, responding to the event, uh, if, if, if at any stage of that process, the communication is unreliable, uh, the responders' lives and the citizens' lives are, are at risk. And, and, and uh, I'll, uh, Rick, I'd like to expand on that a little bit. Yes, uh, you mentioned uh, a ambulance uh, service uh, as well and the EMS uh, uh, responders. Uh, when they have a, uh, uh, patient uh, that needs to be transported to the, the hospital, uh, it's certainly helpful for them to be able to communicate clearly with the hospital ahead of time such that the uh, uh, medical personnel can prepare efficiently uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the patient uh, based on their needs. Uh, we met specifically with uh, representatives from uh, Central Vermont Medical Center and they indicated how the, the coverage problems hampered that process uh, severely. Uh, there were some areas where the, uh, uh, the hospital desk could not hear the ambulance uh, as they were transporting patients. Uh, they could not get sufficient information as to uh, the type of uh, ailment uh, the patient had or what their needs were. Uh, so they had to wait until uh, the, the ambulance arrived at the hospital before they could make accommodation. Uh, better communications would uh, uh, certainly enhance uh, their response and, and uh, you know, provide uh, safe critical time during uh, a medical emergency. Uh, if I could add to that also, I mean, there. You know, there were, there's also an interest in, in public safety into, you know, using broadband communications. However, you know, your radio networks are, 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 poor, prop, are operating and, and performing so poorly, you know, they need to be addressed. Um, uh, it would be nice if, if funding wasn't an issue, but it always is. Um, but, you know, we, we really need to address our radio communication uh, uh, issues before we really can even engage in broadband uh, communication solutions that would even, you know, enhance a uh, responder's ability to perform, you know, their functions and, and, and address citizen uh, needs. Dominic, do you think it's fair to say that in the next 10 years, virtually every family in central Vermont will need emergency services for some member of the family. Uh, I think that's absolutely uh, uh, very likely, Ken. Certainly, uh, it's sad to say, but uh, most likely that's the case. I have a hand up from the Woodbury Fire Department, I believe. Woodbury and Waterbury. Water, Waterbury Fire Department. Water, Waterbury. Sorry. Yeah, uh, um, just a, a, a couple quick questions as I was listening to this, um, it, we already have um, fire ground frequencies. We don't use them, we're, they're not assigned. Um, but the, I think the comment was made that our current system doesn't allow the dispatchers to monitor those. And my question for that piece is, 
are we next gonna look at increasing the dispatchers so that they can monitor a number of different departments who are on fire ground frequencies or tactical frequencies? So that's one question. And then the comment was just made about hospitals and ambulances can't communicate sometimes with hospitals. So are we next gonna be looking at the um, here frequencies and upgrading that? Are we gonna be responsible for that? I'll, I'll take the, the second question uh, first. Uh, the uh, regional system concept design uh, that uh, Televate has uh, developed and put together does include additional receivers uh, for that frequency that's used uh, for ambulance to hospital communication. Uh, so so it, does in, it does include additional infrastructure to enhance that communication. Okay. However, but are they, however, are, they are the, are the mm -hmm. hospitals going to be paying for a portion of this or is that going to fall on us so that the hospitals can hear us better? Uh, I'd, I'd like to say I, 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 all stakeholders that are users of the network should have a financial stake in the in the development and operations of the radio network. If if the if a community benefits from it, they in our in my opinion, in our opinion, and what we've seen throughout the country um, is that all users of the radio network should pay. Uh, a, a, a proportion of their fair use of the radio network, including financial capital investments that benefit them. And the hospital is interested in being at the table and, and participating in decisions and cost. Thank you. And, and so the, if I could get to this. As, and, and that location is being pursued as a, a, a possible uh, uh, location for uh, additional radio transmitters. All right, so, sir, uh, Chief, if I could get to your first question. Uh, absolutely, and, and I, I'm not gonna speak on behalf of Carrie and, and, and the others. Uh, uh, they certainly could speak for themselves. But yes, if there are more channels to monitor, to communicate over, um, it, could, it is going, it could potentially put a strain on the uh, the staffing at the dispatch center, and I I don't know today uh, what those risks are, but uh, and and if there is a shortage of staffing, but but yes, uh, it typically the more channels you have to monitor and communicate over, it does increase the burden on your personnel. So what extent, so I can like, I can speak real brief on that. We're already down two positions. So we just filled one, we have somebody in training and then we're down one position already. And at any given time, if two of our dispatchers that are on duty are taking say a structure fire, we're committed to that call. So it can be a struggle enough if we get another critical incident and to have to listen to a fire ground channel could be a burden on those dispatchers for other people calling in. Thank you, Karen. All right, any other questions before we move on? Okay, Don. Okay, thank you. Uh, continuing on with the recommendations, uh, we've had some discussion already about uh, broadband systems and, and how uh, it, there is a nationwide trend uh, for public safety users to incorporate uh, broadband uh, communications uh, into their toolbox, uh, if you will. Uh, of course, uh, LMR radio is uh, excellent uh, technology for instant voice communications, but uh, uh, Broadband communications provides additional capability that can supplement that voice communication. Uh, there is a uh, form, uh, nationwide network known as FirstNet, uh, FirstNet responder uh, or First Responder Network Authority. Uh, and they are building out a nationwide network in every state. Uh, we recommend that, that uh, uh, Central Vermont coordinate with uh, the state first net uh, uh, stakeholders and understand what improvements first net plans to make in the central Vermont area to enhance the broadband systems uh, throughout that area. 
uh, once uh, once that infrastructure is uh, enhanced, uh, then the use of uh, broadband systems can be and applications can be incorporated into uh, public safety users to uh, to enhance uh, their operations and uh, provide them additional capabilities to uh, uh, better execute their mission. Push the talk over cellular and mission critical push the talk and help uh, supplement where there may be difficulties with uh, LMR communications. Also on the broadband side, there are a number of applications that have been developed specifically for public safety use. Things such as situational awareness on the law enforcement side, uh, building plans uh, to assist with uh, fire operations, uh, uh, EMS uh, applications as well uh, are are prevalent that can be used once uh, broadband systems have been enhanced. Uh, so we recommend developing a strategic plan as to how those applications uh, can be utilized and enhance the public safety mission. Uh, moving on, uh, Rick, uh, I believe uh, you're going to address governance. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, so you know uh, you have a governance model today. Um, and you know the CDPSA is a, is a, is a regional governance model, as that as Donna indicated when we you know as we started, it, it encompasses uh, you know the, the two cities, uh, Barry City and Montpelier, and um, a Central Fire uh, Capital Fire. I'm sorry, is also a member uh, and, and has seats at the board. However, it, it, it doesn't extend to all of the towns that are are part of the service. Uh, uh, of, of the two dispatch centers. And, and, and so, you know, basically, you know, in terms of what is C, we, we really want to, uh, we recommend that we've got to clarify uh, the role of the Central Bronx Public Safety Authority's role in funding, procuring, and operating uh, regional telecommunication systems. There's a real benefit to all users in a regional network because interoperability, um, uh, efficient and, and, and cost-effective uh, investments in these systems when they're regionally developed instead of instead of them being individual, uh, each entity has their own. Um, so, but what role and how do you govern this? I mean, there has to be, a, 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 if you look at the interoperability continuum, governance is really the foundation. How do you govern yourselves and how do you make it happen? And you know, there's reasonable, you know, significant investments that have to be made to achieve, you know, the the, the reliability and the performance of, of public safety rated communications. So we also have to do a procurement. Um, and in terms of operations, you know, what do you, how does that go going forward in a in a regional radio network environment? Um, you know, we we recommend that you know we've got to integrate city leadership. Um, you know, from the two cities to support funding and procurement. Um, there, you know, CBPSA has bonding authority, but they don't have a revenue source that is going to make it efficient and, and, and attractive to a bonding bank or others to, to bond a build out. But, you know, we've got to have the cities and the city leadership in there to participate um, in, in guiding this and, and finding funding and, and supporting procurement. Um, you know, we also recommend it that, you know, uh, the charter be extended to include and support town membership. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, a select board member, some of them are on this call, and I appreciate your being there. Uh, I wish I was there in person to meet you. Um, but, you know, we recommend it that because it's a regional network that we yeah, the towns be engaged uh, and have a seat at the table to participate. We also recommend that, that there be greater fire chief participation on the board, um, at the board level. Um, and um, I think that's in play. And, and that, that we, you know, we'll recommend it, that there be a, a prudent use of committees, subcommittees, and working groups to uh, make recommendations to the board, um, experts that are, you know, the subject matter experts for a, a particular uh, cause. So there's a technical committee, there might be a finance committee, there could be a training committee, and, and you have some of these in place now. But the best 
governance models we've seen uh, are, are, you know, have, you have the foundation for them right now. The participation that you have now on an ongoing basis is something that a lot of folks and communities don't do well. So you have a really good foundation. And now you need to def, you know, build upon it and, and solidify its purpose and, and its support from the community. And in our report, we, you know, we, we wrote, a, a, you know, a, a, I think a, 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 a good model for you, if you haven't read the report, I, I highly recommend you start with a governance section because it's a, it gives you a good understanding of the purpose for governance. Next slide, please. All right, so, uh, you know, just to, to close out this part of our presentation, um, you know, we really looked at regional partnerships, the most effective uh, uh, communication systems for public safety really incorporate other partners, not, you know, if you, if it's only the public safety, um, then all the, all the burden of cost is borne by public safety and the governments um, for which they, 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 they work under or for. So, you know, we wanted to see as part of the study, you know, if there were partnerships within the region that, that would be good players and good partners for you. Um, and so a, a part of, uh, of the, you know, of, of the, the scope of the work was to really investigate partnerships. So we, we did, and, and, you know, we reached out to, we had an opportunity to have outreach and communication with a few of them. CV Fiber is a municipal corporation that is building broadband, and their their mission is to build broadband. They've got you know fund, federal funding, they, and they're building fiber to unserved and underserved communities of of um, Central Vermont. They 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 we talked to them about providing fiber uh, could be a redundant to some of our tower sites, and I think those discussions should continue. So we identified a few towers that they they pass by that could be of use to us. We also spoke to the Washington Electric uh, Cooperative. Um, radio, they have radio towers and, and you know, they, they in, you know, in place of operating their own radio network, why not invite them on to be a partner and use your radio network? Obviously you would have your dedicated channels. They, they would have some dedicated channels, but they would bring assets to the table and, and you could operate a regional network that would also cost share um, um, some of the, the capital and operational ongoing costs. We additionally spoke to Vermont Electric Power Company. They've got a statewide radio network and they had, I think over 50 towers, radio towers, some of them in your backyard um, that, and in fact, some of them they own, you're, you're already on, but uh, the, um, capital fire is already on. But they have backhaul, and they were they were really eager to be a, a, a you know a, a participating member. They, you know, they're they're also a municipal uh, utility company, and they want to be a partner as well. And we didn't directly speak with the state of Vermont. Uh, Televa, Televate has worked for the state of the Vermont in the past, but you know, Dom did mention that they're working on that CAD system and. I know some people don't think that is a CAD system, so I, I, I can't speak for it because I don't know it, but they have radio towers that might be accessible and, and we, they should be uh, approached if they haven't already about what they can contribute. If, if, if we can, you know, if we can leverage assets of partners as well as provide and, and share assets and access to systems, it's going to be better for the for the all of the players, and so um, we we we, or we documented our findings with them and and contacts and recommended that we follow up with them, um, uh, you know, as soon as as logically reasonable. Okay, so we're going to go into talk about the radio network, and before we do, I, I just want to check in for two things. One. Time. Uh, I, I know we, we've uh, we've got a little longer meeting than last night, but I want to be sure, Donna, that we're that our pace is okay, or um, and we we've, you know, we've got we can take some more time to go through the the proposed design. Uh, yes, I think continue. All right, and, and before we go into that, are there any questions uh, before we move it, move into the into the the, the regional land mobile radio network concept? Okay, Don. Thank you. 
You're welcome, sir. Uh, as we uh, discussed, part of our so scope was to uh, present uh, potential solutions for the uh, communications gaps uh, that we saw within uh, central Vermont. Uh, and uh, a lot of that focuses on a regional concept design. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk on, on a high level of a, a dual simulcast system uh, concept approach. Uh, as uh, and many of you know, uh, you have uh, individual radio sites that are in use today uh, that are not simulcast. Uh, the stakeholders uh, within uh, the Central of Moran have recognized that uh, a simulcast system is needed. Uh, we wholeheartedly agree with that uh, to, uh, both improve coverage and to uh, uh, ensure uh, all users uh, are able to uh, communicate um, uh, over the network and it reduces, uh, significantly reduces the congestion. Uh, we've looked at different needs uh, for the city areas versus the uh, rural uh, capital fire uh, town areas and we're proposing a dual uh, simulcast system to address those uh, uh, different requirements. So we uh, would include two simulcast cells or subsystems. Uh, again, one focused on the city area, uh, Montpelier and Barry, and the corridor in between, and then one focused on the broader area that covers all the towns. Uh, so we have specific sites we've identified for each of those systems. We've done uh, preliminary uh, propagation simulations to ensure adequate coverage. Uh, and we recommend uh, a uh, common system using a common core, uh, which will uh, be the most efficient way to implement such a system. It will also provide access from each of the dispatch centers uh, and uh, also uh, we've included uh, additional receive uh, sites to improve the ambulance to a uh, uh, medical center uh, coverage. Uh, last night- uh, we John, were... may, I, may I stop you a second, sir? Would you, for those yep. who are not technically uh, astute about this, can you explain to people what a simulcast radio network is? Uh, yes, uh, and, and uh, thanks, Rick, and I'll use this to, to do so. Thank uh, you, sir. Part of our uh, analysis included recording uh, uh, data, recording signal level from the uh, uh, various radio sites uh, that we're in use today, and we formed a, a simulation using a public safety propagation tool uh, to, uh, to estimate the current coverage. Uh, there are currently five uh, transmit uh, sites in use today, and those are independent. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll use independent as non-simulcast. So each of those five uh, sites are used uh, separately or independently. So the dispatcher needs to understand uh, the uh, area of the call, where the call is originating from, and they then uh, pick the correct tower or uh, radio site to use to transmit their information. So while we're showing here what we uh, predict as the current Capital Fire coverage area, uh, it's shown as a composite of those five sites, uh, but in reality, each one is only used uh, independently at a given time. Uh, and what, uh, what you're looking at here is uh, on the left is what we call outbound communication. Uh, so that's the communication from dispatch or from the radio tower to the first responder in the field. And then on the right is the inbound, which is shown as the uh, coverage for uh, radio user in the field back to the dispatch. You'll see that the inbound is more restrictive than the outbound. Uh, that's uh, especially typical in this type of system uh, because outbound has a greater, uh, much greater power, uh, typically 100 watts or more coming from the tower, where on the inbound side, uh, this assumes uh, a radio user has a portable radio, 
mounted on their hip and the portable radio has uh, much less power, uh, 55 watts. Uh, so that's why you see the uh, uh, lesser coverage on the right. Uh, any questions on that before I proceed? Okay, we'd like to uh, compare that with the uh, dual system uh, conceptual design that we put together. Uh, so we see much greater coverage here, uh, both on the outbound and the uh, inbound side. Uh, the outbound uh, uh, very effectively uh, covers the uh, uh, essentially the entire capital fire uh, mons area. Here we are utilizing a total of nine sites and they are configured in a simulcast operation. Uh, so that means that all nine sites are used to transmit the same information at the same time. Uh, so users throughout the network uh, hear the information simultaneously. Uh, again, we see a little bit different uh, coverage on the inbound, uh, mainly because of the uh, lower power of the uh, portable radio. Uh, but uh, that, of course, uh, that coverage is uh, much uh, improved with a mobile radio. And uh, that is why we also recommend the use of vehicular repeaters in this concept design to help extend that portable radio coverage. Uh, again, you'll see nine sites in use here. Uh, many of the same current sites are used, uh, as well as uh, additional sites, uh, primarily in the uh, uh, southern portion of the response area. Have some additional uh, coverage uh, 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 predictions uh, shown on the left. We are showing uh, what we recommend as improved in-building coverage uh, for the city areas. Uh, so that's shown uh, specifically for the uh, Montpelier and Berry City areas. And that's shown as coverage inside uh, a, a, uh, what we call a uh, medium a construction building. Uh, then uh, in the center, uh, we show the mobile, mobile coverage uh, for the concept system that was developed. Uh, so this is, is coverage to and from uh, a mobile radio or a ra uh, radio mounted in a vehicle. So you can see this uh, comprehensively covers the uh, area required uh, for uh, capital fire, including uh, all the towns that we have identified. Uh, finally, on the right, uh, you'll see the improved ambulance to uh, medical center uh, coverage uh, by including additional receivers at three strategically placed uh, locations. Uh, and uh, time to move on to the uh, cost analysis, uh, next steps. Uh, before we do that, any uh, questions on uh, the concept design or what was uh, recently presented? So, uh, Dom, could you uh, please uh, go back to that last slide, please? Yes, thank you. All right, so uh, as a number of you are aware of, a Capital Fire had uh, solicited a, a, a design from uh, Burlington Radio Shop, um, and it, you know, it had fewer towers than what we recommend now because we that that design when we modeled that design, so we use our propagation tool, we modeled that design, and there were still some, you know, when we were visit did site visits with uh, with Joe Allsworth, we. You know, we identified that there would still be gaps in, in that initial design. And so we added some additional sites. And yeah, so, as you, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, just to point out, as, as uh, you all uh, well know, there's uh, very challenging terrain within the central Vermont area. So that uh, has uh, a significant impact on the coverage of uh, individual tower sites. It makes it difficult to identify those sites and difficult to uh, cover a large area with uh, a single site. And, uh, uh, that's why you see a large number of sites being used here, uh, to provide right. comprehensive coverage. Absolutely. And so I, I want you to pay attention to the slide on the the the, 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 
the 20 dB uh, a medium in building um, coverage uh, site uh, plot. So, you know, what does that mean? What does 20 dB of, of uh, in building coverage means? Well, that means that the signal is, you know, is seven times weaker uh, out, uh, inside than outside. So, uh, as a radio signal travels through walls, it degrades, it, it weakens. You know, it's sort of like, you know, using your dimmer switch to turn your 100 watt light bulb down to just the, you know, the dimmest, so a, a one watt. You know, you're, you're, you're losing, you, you've, re, you've re, reduced the power of the light bulb uh, intentionally. Here, buildings just, you know, they suck up radio power. Um, and, and, and so what we're trying to demonstrate here is that in a, a building that, that is 20 dB, uh, that, was, that was gonna provide 20 dB of signal loss, um, it, you're, you know, that's what we've modeled. However, there, there's two things that we need to be careful of here or aware of. One, you, you have buildings that are probably higher than 20 dB um, because of granite. And two, the, the VHF radio signal is, is over 20 foot in wavelength. And that radio wave has a very difficult time getting into buildings um, windows, doors, uh, any, any way it can get in. It, it, it just has a harder time getting in. And that's why we've also recommended, you know, vehicular repeaters, which, you know, give you a little, you know, will, will regenerate a signal out from outside, takes the over air signal, re, you know, retransmits it in building and gives you a little bit more power. So that, that, that was why that, that, you know, we wanted to say, well, reliably to improve the reliability of service in your buildings, you know, a combination of more sites and, and potentially um, vehicular repeaters. So I just wanted to clarify that to ensure that, you know, you understood what these maps also represent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move in the system cost analysis and next steps. Um, I have a quick question. Yes, sir. This is uh, Nick Brissett with the Washington Select Board. How does the simulcast system work with multiple channels? Like if Barry and Montpelier are gonna have their own channel and the rest of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid have their own, how does the system work with multiple channels operating off it? Uh, so each, each channel is supported at every site. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, recommended for Capital Fire would be a nine site simulcast system. So you'd have every channel uh, supported at every site. So when one channel was activated, it would activate on all nine sites and transmit that information simultaneously. And if the other channel was in use, uh, exactly the same thing. It would transmit on all nine channels. Uh, you, can support mul you can support multiple channels at a given site uh, by either using separate antennas or by combining the channels uh, into a, uh, an RF uh, component known as a combiner uh, to, uh, to utilize a single antenna. And, but you would have a separate radio base station for each channel. Okay. And, and when you, sorry, when you do the cost, will that also include how, how much it costs to have each channel be simulcast? Oh yes, uh, the, the cost analysis does include the, uh, the number of sites uh, recommended here and the number of channels as well. So, so Nick, Great, there's, also, there's also a, a really important beneficial operational benefits from, from a simulcast radio network. Um, as Don mentioned earlier today, we've got to steer the communication to what we anticipate is the, is the strongest serving tower. And sometimes that isn't the strongest serving tower because of your terrain. In, in the simulcast network, the communication is sent simultaneously to all the towers in the simulcast cell. So therefore then a dispatcher and a radio user doesn't have to affiliate with a channel at a tower. They just have to affiliate with, a, with the, the communication path. It simplifies operational um, uh, for, uh, for both the dispatchers and for the radio, uh, the, the first responders uh, um, taking the call. 
right. and, and it is a very prudent and, and efficient way um, of, of um, achieving reliable communications. Um, and, and so, you know, it was already on the plate um, as something of, of benefit and it, it, is, it is the right way to go. Um, and, and another difficulty, if I can add, of the current uh, system is that when uh, multiple uh, uh, agencies have to be alerted, uh, they may be in different areas and require different uh, uh, towers to reach them. So that would require multiple uh, transmissions and multiple uh, actions by the dispatcher uh, to, uh, to alert those different agencies. Uh, that would be eliminated with a simulcast system. All uh, agencies would be able to do the different mission uh, just, just once over that simulcast network. And by having two cells, the, the, the dispatching within the two cities would be done on a separate dispatch channel in that cell. And so today when you dispatch, everyone is dispatched together. So now you know, we, we, we make the network perform more efficiently by focusing the dispatch to different to those two different geographies. And, and it, it, it's actually a, just a more robust way to do it. It also takes traffic off of, of channels. You have more channels and, and everyone then isn't dispatched every time a call for service goes out. Um, we segregate it by cities and, and towns, but you also program those channels into the radios so that that you know the the, the 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 capital fire can still listen in and be called for service. So you know they would still have channels. Everyone would have the similar similar channels, but dispatching would be sent to those you know those two different you know those three different user communities. I know it's a lot to absorb. Uh, you know we've been doing this all our lives. We try to simplify it, but you're you're asking all the right questions. And, and I hope we've answered them the way that, and you understand the objective. I understand, thanks. Pleasure, sir. Okay, Don, let's go, go for this, okay? All right, so, you know, here's some, you know, I mean, basically uh, a CBPSA uh, considerations. Um, basically, you, your communication gaps require immediate attention and you know, when I say immediate, you've already been discussing this for, for a number of years. I mean, we, the longer we wait, the greater you're at risk. And so, you know, we, the, 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 we're, and, and we've done, a, you know, done a good job. And we've got a report out within the last um, month and a half. We've had, you know, meetings with the cities and, and now with the, with the towns and Capitol Fire. Um, so, you know, we've got to keep the momentum going. I mean, it's important. These, we, need to, we need to figure out how to address uh, these, these issues now. Um, well, there certainly needs to be a viable source of funding um, for um, what, you know, what you, you as a group decide needs to be done. And we're going to, we'll go into the, the capital expenditures nest, but you've got to have capital expenditures and you also have to, at the same time, when you build your governance model, you have to address the operational expenditures. So I need X amount of million dollars to build the network, but I need an ongoing pool, steady revenue to operate the network. Of too frequently, we find the funds to build the network, but we didn't address how we're going to sustain it long term. So you've got, we've got to address both of them in our governing, governing model. Um, We've got to manage the procurement. So, you know, you can't just go into, into uh, Costco and buy the radio network. And, you, you know, it's government procurement. So we've got to have a formal procurement process. You know, we've got to write uh, an RFP. We've got to solicit, solicit bids. And we've got to do this soon because that is, a, you know, the first long, you know, first long pull on attendance, agreeing to what we're going to do and finding the funding for it. And we've got to go and procure it. Um, we, we think that partnerships with utilities and some of the broadband entities we mentioned have merit. Um, they they should be considered uh, whether or not they can, you can get them lined up before we can sort out the funding and do the procurement. It, it, it may not happen, but it could happen uh, uh, um, after the fact. But it's something that should be you know considered. Are, are, are your, your one of your biggest dilemmas is that particularly for capital fire. 
you're a volunteer. These are all volunteers. You have full-time lives and jobs and other responsibilities. It's very difficult to achieve all these objectives with only a volunteer force. So by pooling your energies together, um, you know, there's going, it's going, you're going to get to the finish line sooner. Um, um, but, you know, it, it, it's certainly having other partners makes a difference. And, you know, you've got a good governance structure today. And, um, you know, we're confident you can build on it. Um, you know, yes, governance is hard. Uh, if people, there's a number of, you, there's a lot of brilliant people and, and strong personalities um, within your community. <laughs> and, you know, we've got to find a way for all of us to work together. We've got to reach consensus. You've got to, you know, to, to uh, compromise. You've got to just reach consensus on these matters. Um, lives are at risk. Um, and, and so we need to, you know, put aside anything that's uh, that's at difference. Of course, you know, I'm confident you can do that. Um, but you know, it is never. It, we we work in a lot of governance models, state models, uh, communities like yours, large cities. I I, I could tell you all kinds of, uh, uh, of you know frightening stories about how it goes. But in the end, people find a way to work together, and and you we're you're doing that now and forward. I also wanted to just look to the graphic. It says engineering process. Um, you know, there's been some, you know, some questioning about, well, what, you know, what is the engineering process and what do we got to do and how do we got to do it? Um, basically, you know, we try to simplify this into three steps, the needs assessment and the concept design, which we have in our, in our, um, we state it within the report. And, and again, building on the body of work that, you know, folks in your region have already started. Then we go into a procurement phase and a vendor engineering and high level design. I, I, I'd like to say that we have a really good high level design because we visited sites. Um, we don't know if those sites are available to us, if they can be leased or, or if the towers of any of, of your sites are gonna sustain, um, you know, they, they have the ability to sustain the communication, the, the antennas and cables additional, but, but we've got a good high level design out there um, and, you know, we just, you know, we need to do some, uh, you know, additional work to solidify uh, leases and to do some um, loading analysis on the towers um, and so forth and so on. But everything we've looked at is an existing tower. We didn't see the need to build new towers. Um, you know, we, we and, and again, some of your partners have towers that might be better and at no available at no cost to you. But you know, we've got a good high level design that can facilitate a vendor procurement and the vendor's engineering. A vendor is gonna engineer it and say, if we hand over this constellation of sites, they're gonna tell us you know, what, what kind of service and what kind of guarantee of coverage they're gonna give on them. But we, you know, we're, 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 we've come a long way on that. And then if the final step is you know, after the procurement is done um, and the vendor is selected, then you gotta go and build it. And, you know, things happen when you're when you're building a radio network. You discover things that you didn't know were going to happen. Um, uh, I, 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 we have a big project uh, working on a big project in Los Angeles. I was on the phone with them last night, and they had solidified some mountain sites um, and and a, and a coastal site. And and when they went to do ground soil studies, they had already done some. They found out that they were given land that was a dump for concrete that had been removed and now there's all this concrete that wasn't available before aware of before now the cost of that build is going to go up and and you know there wasn't a, a pile of money set aside to, to facilitate that but during the build things happen uh, our goal is to really ensure that that we we understand what all those risks are um, but you know during the, the, the detailed design and implementation uh, things can happen, but a simple three-step process. I just wanted to share with you. All right, next next slide, please. Okay, so I, I don't think this you know this cost slide is is new to most of you, um, but um, you know basically what we've done here is we have quantified the cost for the recommended design and improvements and enhancements that that are are uh, detailed within the report 
And um, we've quantified them based on cost modeling of them through uh, independent research and through also our our knowledge of building and you know building systems like this and in, in, in environments like yours. And you know, we're familiar with you know simulcast analog simulcast networks. So you know this is what 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 budget we've put together. And we were additionally asked to prioritize some of these line items. Um, uh, and, and you know, as you can see, most of these, you know, these are all things that we've talked about during a presentation. But, and, and a number of them were, were we, they were verified with the stakeholders. I mean, we, you know, number of radios you have and, and, and um, you know, how many uh, uh, consoles were required and what their costs are. You know, this, the, the, only, the only item on here that, you know, if and where required is tower upgrades and reinforcement. We put a budget together of $330,000 um, in the event that radio towers have to be upgraded. We, we can't, and during the study, we didn't do a tower loading analysis, but a tower loading analysis study will have to be done to determine if any of the tower structures need to be reinforced um, to support new antennas and cables. And that's very common. Um, and, and so, you know, that's the only thing that, you know, the only line item there um, and, and potentially showers that might be leaking or aren't large enough for our needs. So we, we put a budget together for that. But each of these other line items, uh, you know, were, were based on um, research and, and, and best practices and, and, and information that we're very aware of. So with that said, is, is, are there any questions about about you know what we've presented so far in this this uh, this budget here. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. My trip from Whitefield faced in fire. You uh, expressed that you looked at pre-existing sites. Um, I was under the impression there was going to be a new site in uh, Warren. Is that correct? Chelsea. Um, yes. Yes, that's correct. Is that a new radio tower, Don? Uh, Chelsea? I, I can answer that, Donna. Yeah, that, uh, that is uh, assumed in the uh, concept, concept design of the Lincoln Peak site, I believe. Yeah, uh, you're right, Doc. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, that site is uh, existing. Uh, there were uh, estimates uh, included to, uh, to enhance the, uh, the tower and shelter at that site. Thank you very much. Also, I noticed on the mapping coverage, um, one of the maps didn't even have the town of Faston in it. Um, I was wondering, is there um, any more studies or any more improvement for the town of Faston? A uh, closer look at that. Can we go back to the map, Don? I am. Uh... Yes, uh, yes, just, uh, just a second. I believe... Uh... Should be included. Uh, were, were you referring to the uh, coverage? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Based in uh, the town of uh, that is to the uh, west of the uh, uh, Waitsfield uh, site. There is that correct? Yes, sir. So that that is included in the. Uh, uh, in the response area and in the uh, land uh, coverage area as well. I'll, uh, I'll scroll back up towards the top. Use the scrolling for a minute. Uh, so this is the service area we show here. I, uh, it is uh, uh, somewhat uh, partially transparent behind the words, but uh, Faston is uh, included in this. Yes, but I was taking a look at the um, the better service area, the coverage area. Um, how much that's going to improve from the pre-existing that we have? Okay, uh, our uh, our analysis shows that there's uh, uh, very little uh, coverage uh, from on the portable on the portable side uh, currently within Faston. Uh, due to the terrain, uh, the Waitsfield site is currently in use, uh, but the uh, concept design also brings in the Lincoln Peak 
uh, site which uh, does improve coverage within phase two. I think you can see from, uh, from here in the center, uh, the mobile uh, coverage uh, is uh, comprehensive throughout the town in the uh, center uh, map there. Yes, thank you for your time. Uh, Joe would like to say something. He's attending in person. So in working with uh, Televate, we uh, looked at the southern end of the uh, service area and it was not balanced. So we developed the, uh, the Beacon Hill Tower to address Washington, Williamstown in that area. And then we looked at relocating uh, the Turkey Hill Tower in Northfield to Norwich University. And that picked up on the promulgation maps uh, significant increase in Northfield and in uh, Roxbury. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dom. No, you're absolutely right, uh, Joe. That's uh, uh, correct here. Uh, you can see on, uh, on, on both of these, uh, the, uh, uh, the Beacon Hill site to the, to the south uh, helps cover uh, that uh, southern area very well. There is the Norwich University site uh, also in the uh, uh, center south and the Lincoln Peak site are, are three new sites uh, that uh, greatly enhance the uh, coverage in the southern portion of the response area. I have a comment for costs when you're ready to go back to that. There's some other uh, hands up, uh, Nick and the Morgantown Chief. Go ahead. Uh, Stephen Pry here, the chief of Moortown. In your uh, study showing the coverage, is it assuming that the Waterbury Tower is going to be moved to Blush Hill, or is it assuming was it at its current location? Uh, it is assumed in the uh, the new location, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, if you can see on this, uh, uh, the old uh, this shows uh, in that area it shows two sites close to each other. The one that's shown uh, yellow or highlighted. That's the one that's uh, being used in this uh, coverage model. It also shows the current Waterbury uh, site and that one's uh, uh, not highlighted. So that's not being used in that model. Does that answer Thank your you. question, sir? Yes, it does. Okay, uh, sorry for the scrolling, uh, going back to the <laughs> Uh, the cost. All good questions. So thank you. Are there any others um, before we get to Donna's? Donna, what can we, a question we can ask for you, answer for you, ma'am. <laughs> well, my question revolves around the discussion that Paco and Doug Hoyt recently had with some members from Capital Far dealing with a $3.9 million for the simulcast. I don't know if you're equipped to talk about that or if I should ask Doug or Joe. I, I don't know the question, so. Well, we've been discussing a $3.9 million. That's the more pri first priority coming out. The consoles around the 700,000 and the yes, 3 million for the simulcast. And we, we don't have a slide on that, but I do wanna have a, just a little awareness to people about that we're looking at a first step is 3.9 not 6.4 right thank you yeah i think joe wants to talk so i think if you look at televate's estimate that is the cadillac uh version of the radio system so that is everything inclusive that is the televate's uh 3000 overview of the uh the, the needs assessment that they conducted if you look at the uh, priority ones, I think that's where the uh, 3.9 comes from with uh, Donna and you reflect uh, Chief Bothfeld's letter and the letter from mm -hmm. the cities reflecting first step is to do the priority ones. Um, and then uh, as we go down the road, then we look at priority two and threes as network is, uh, you know, broadband is more robust and built out. Uh, and and as the uh, other stuff comes into play, but right now to address the issues with 
the, the radio system, the priority ones should be the focus. And that's the focus of the two letters that you got from uh, Chief Boffeld and the uh, Twin Cities letter. Uh, and Joe, can I also, I just want one clarification. The, the 700,000 for the dispatch consoles is not included in the in, in that, right? I mean, the- Right, the, we, the, the cities, yeah. both Barry and Montpelier, at least staff wise, made the commitment that the cities would get the console. That's and, correct. So the number yeah. would be higher if, if the cities hadn't, you know, ponied up the funding for the consoles. And that, right. that, so let me just clarify that. That was the recommendation of the, the chiefs and the cities. That is not from the uh, the city councils of Barry Montpelier. They have not made that decision. Okay, that's important. Just that's so everybody's important. clear on that. Yeah. That's important clarification, okay. sir. Thank you. Montpelier City Council, I can say as a city council member, did put the Montpelier Council in for our FY22. It was one of many capital items that got taken out when we had to reduce our budget because reduced revenues around the pandemic. So we're hoping to backfill that as we get uh, American rescue money. But it, its concept has been improved by Montpelier City Council. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so, um, <laughs> you know, yes, I mean, funding is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's obviously, you know, the no adage, money doesn't grow on trees, although in Vermont, you got some great trees up there. Maybe, maybe there, there is there is something growing on those trees that's valuable outside of maple syrup. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it isn't. There isn't a network uh, that needs enhancement that you know where funding isn't you know the key, uh, you know the first step that has to be addressed. So. Um, okay, I'm seeing some more hands up, but I do want to bring your attention to ten minutes left. Okay. We stay longer than nine o'clock if people are willing. Um, so I, I see the Moortown Chief and Nicole, Nick, Nicholas, uh, hands up. Maybe you could address those and then see if the group wants to continue. Otherwise, you should sum up. All right, well, Nick's hand has been up quite some time. I think he should, he, he's got a good question. So, sir, what can we, what can we answer for you? So my question is regarding the $2.9 million. Does that include boosting the hospital channel? And does that also include the Barry Montpelier separate dispatch channel? Uh, it doesn't include the, um, it does not include the, uh, the, the VM, the VMED receivers, which is, is we, we push that to a priority three. That's because, a separate you know, item, right. We want to get, we, and we want them to, you know, pony up some funds. So we, that's why I went there. Um, the regional network includes, um, um, yes, it includes upgrades yeah. for a, a, a regional network. So it does include both cities yeah. and, and capital. Correct. And I didn't see the slide, but maybe Joe can speak to it. What are the priority one, two, and three? Uh, so priority ones are the regional radio system infrastructure, procurement, project management, governance, and control. Oh, I see it now. I'm sorry. I see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All thank right. you. You're welcome, sir. All right. An any, another question? Um, Donna, is there another question? Well, I, I, I saw the Moortown chief, but maybe it was just left up. I think it was. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know. I can't speak for the chief. Uh, so I um, can't see everybody as a group because I, we're I'm looking and I always see uh, uh, Nick's uh, hand is still up but I think okay like, do I people think. want us to extend for another 30 minutes and get more questions or do you just want us to sum up and try to end by nine o'clock raise your hand if you want us to extend raise your hand if you want us to end at nine I think we only have one more slide yeah. Okay. All right. Do it. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, we had eight, eight minutes. I could, you know, I could stretch this out for eight minutes, but no, I'll, no. I'll, I'll <laughs> All right. So, you know, wh what are the next steps? I mean, obviously, we need to ma maintain the momentum. I mean, a lot of time and effort have been dedicated 
um, to get to this stage uh, long before we were retained and, and have been supported the project. So, um, you know, but, and, and I could see the dedication, the number of, of participants in last night's meeting and today's meeting and in every board meeting, um, uh, 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 there's great momentum. So we need to keep the momentum. Um, we've got to reach consensus on, on how to address and mitigate our communication gaps and requirements. I mean, there, there are, you know, obviously there's as many opinions as people participating. Um, and however, uh, however we can get to, you know, through governance, get to a consensus um, on, on how to address it and how to pay for it and how to fund it on term needs to be done. The, you know, the idea is to really put a support core team together to focus on key areas. I mean, you've got to focus on governance, uh, the structure, the cost formulas, the operating roles, responsibilities. Um, you know, we've got to we've got to maintain that through a core team. Finance, we, we it, it's clear we've got to secure funding, um, and we've got to secure commitment from those who are going to you know step up and pay and pay for the network however we can do it well, it was an approach to get some grant you know some federal funding but it, it didn't it wasn't successful yet but we shouldn't give up on it um you know the, there's a number of technical recommendations that we provided um there are a variety of things that were in there and we've got to have a technical team uh, to continue advancing them and then an implementation an implementation and operations team um, you know, to develop SOPs and training and operations and, and maintenance uh, support. You know, you could divide this up amongst the, the team um, to conquer it, uh, but you know, you, you really need a core team um, and we're gonna need some, some volunteers um, um, that, you know, can, can continue to support um, this program till we get to the finish line. Um, we can't stress upon you uh, how important it is to, to continue this and reach the finish line uh, as soon as possible. Uh, every day there's a risk out there. Every time there's a call for service and a responder and responding team goes, there are risks out there. And um, you know, we, we don't want to see us then, you know, running into a point where, where because of a communication, uh, lack of performance of communications, a call for service not getting through or the right information not getting there, uh, leading to um, uh, an unforeseen uh, tragedy that, you know, we, we, we just want, you know, want, we need to get this done. And, and whatever we can do to help, we're, you know, we're, we'll be happy to do that. And I'm speaking for a Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, Donna Bate, is that Public Safety Authority is working with Rick and Dom to go to a next phase so they would facilitate the core team and that public safety authority is not doing this to secure the public safety authorities, Justin. We wanna have a core team that's really going to commit to a coalition that can agree on governance, agree on cost formula, and agree to move ahead to secure funding. And we're asking Capital West, not Capital West, excuse me, Capital Fire, <laughs> Capital Fire Mutual Aid, to make a decision to commit two people to this core team. And I'm hoping the next board meeting that you'll do that. Uh, very sincerely want to see a coalition move forward. Skip, do you yes. want to say anything? Uh, the members of Capital Fire, as the chiefs and, and your select board members, we need our next meeting will be in November, uh, third, well, month from today. Uh, it is imperative that all of you show up and, and we need to show that we're going to be part of this. And we need to be as a group, you know, show that we want to be part of this. That way you can count on our end of it and it'll help you if you're procuring money or anything else. So that's my pitch here is that a month from today, I'm not sure where we'll have it, but they'll they'll be you know it'll be told. What's that? Alumni Hall, Barry City. Barry City. As many chiefs, all of them need to be there and show your support for this. That way, we can we can speak as one uh, group towards the 
this CPSA that yes, we're on board with this and, and we'll try to do our share. And that way we can work, as you said, as a group and make this happen. And, and you know, we're the Public Safety Authority is committing literally almost its last dime mm. to have this consultant because we know the work that Televate has done, Rick and Dom have gone way beyond uh, anything within our contract. I'm just can't tell you how generous and supportive they've been. So we want them to continue with the core team, but also we are willing to work with Paco and the Board of Public Safety Authority to go out with Capital FAR to the select boards. So along the way, they're being talked to and not waiting to the last minute. We really feel that the select boards need to be more involved and want to work with Capital FAR to involve them. So if there's no other comment from Skip, I'm going to adjourn the meeting for the Public Safety Authority Board. I guess one thing I, I didn't quite come away with here, I didn't see an estimated cost per town for our fire department. Uh, we haven't got to that point. We haven't got to that okay. point. That's what the All core right. team would look at. All right, because that's, that's, that's the first question my select board is going to ask. Uh, yep. Uh, we have an ambulance squad in our town too, and so we split the cost. And they they need to know they're they're a private organization, but they they use the system, so they pay part of the deal. And, yep. and we need mm -hmm. those are those are the the questions that they're going to want to know. And, Absolutely. And at this point, I can see that you we haven't got there yet. So, but that's. That's what's going to sell the thing to a certain degree. We need to have something that, to give them. Uh, and that's what Rick was talking about, a funding plan. Right. We've got the 3.9, and now how do we do the cost formula? Right. How do we get state right. and federal dollars to help support it? That's the funding. How okay. do we secure the funding? Right. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything <laughs> more. Do you, Joe? Uh, I am propose a motion to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I guess. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have worded the same way without any objections, closing right. the, the meeting for Public Safety Authority. Thank you all for attending. Very generous of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.